Lecture 27, El Cid. Welcome to the third of our lectures on the literatures of Europe's Middle Ages. This time, we turn to the Poema de Mio Cid, which takes us into the turbulent world of medieval Iberia. Muslim forces from North Africa overran Iberia between 711 and 716. Initially, they created a weakly unified emirate centered on Cordoba, and from Cordoba governed the rest of the peninsula, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. With fitful starts in the 8th and 9th centuries, Christian forces operating from the far north began the Reconquista, the reconquest, the centuries-long reconquest of Islamic Spain, which didn't conclude until the 15th century. In 1085, Toledo fell to the Christians. Now, a major scene in the poema actually takes place there. Muslim reinforcements flowed into Spain from Morocco and temporarily halted the Reconquista. We learned something about them in the poema, too. A first important point about the poema is that it deals with real people and events, although for reasons we shall soon discuss, the poet allowed himself considerable latitude in handling history. A few preliminaries. Who was El Cid? Rodrigo Diaz was born into the lower nobility in Vivar, near Burgos, in about 1043. He served as standard bearer for King Sancho II of Castile at the Siege of Zamora in 1072, during which battle actually Sancho was assassinated. Sancho's brother and bitter foe, Alfonso VI, who reigned from 1065 to 1102, became King of Leon and then added Castile. He was hostile to Rodrigo and he exiled him twice, partly for personal reasons and partly because a faction at court centered on Count Garcia Ordonez detested him. Rodrigo spent his first exile fighting in eastern Spain as an ally of Emir Mutamin of Zaragoza against other Muslim emirs, but also against Berengar Ramon, the Christian count of Barcelona. Rodrigo continued these wars in his second exile, and then in 1092 he attacked Valencia, which fell to him in 1094. This was his greatest victory, and indeed one of the really important victories in the Reconquest, although it's true that uh, uh, some years later uh, Valencia fell back into the hands of the Muslim forces. Rodrigo died in 1099. Now, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar came to be called El Cid from the Arabic Sayidi, Lord, but he is also called, particularly in the Spanish tradition, Campeador deriving from the Latin campi doctor, which roughly means one who is wise in the affairs of battle. Now, it does seem that Rodrigo was a superb commander, that he was a soldier of fortune, that he was a mercenary, that he was a man who looked out for himself. We know a good deal about him. The Poema de Miocid has its mysteries, but in some respects, perhaps, it is less enigmatic than Beowulf or Roland. Once again, we're faced with the curious fact that the poem survives in a single badly damaged manuscript whose handwriting appears to date from the 14th century. Actually, utterly incompetent attempts to preserve the manuscript in the 19th century and in the early 20th century are partly responsible for the terrible shape that it's in today. But anyway, it survives in one manuscript. At the very end of the poem, however, we read this. Parabat wrote it down in the month of May in the year of our Lord, 1207. What we wouldn't give for a statement like that in Beowulf or Roland. Well, those seemingly simple and straightforward words beg a couple of rather fundamental questions. Who was Parabat? He may simply have been a scribe who wrote down an older poem. He may have been the actual author of the poema. If he was the author, he may be identical with a lawyer of the same name who was attested in legal documents a little bit later. Now, many things about the poem, as we will see, make sense in some ways if we suppose a layman who was a lawyer was its author. The second question. 
What does wrote it down mean? Well, scholarship on El Cid is marked by the same traditionalist versus individualist controversies as attached to Beowulf and Roland. The great Spanish scholar, for example, Ramon Menendez Pidal, devoted much of his scholarly life to studying this remarkable poem and the period which it treats. He believed that it was early, dating from about 1140, probably based on earlier works, both Latin histories and Spanish poems. Now, there are unquestionably Latin histories behind this poem. Whether there is earlier poetry behind it or not, that is a more difficult thing to establish. Oralists, which is another name for traditionalists, partly because of again, certain theories of epic composition, the oral formulaic theory that epic poems are put together sort of on the spot out of formulas that are then assembled and reassembled and disassembled in various combinations. Okay? So oralists or traditionalists, partly because of the way they believe epics are made, and partly because in El Cid there are unquestionably all those formulas, they take a slightly different view than Menendez Pidal, for example. They also see the poem as early, but what they believe is that the written version we have is the writing down of much older oral material, almost certainly vernacular and almost certainly in verse. Well, uh, one of the great problems, of course, is that one cannot find all of this material that is allegedly behind El Cid, or for that matter, just about any of the other epics that we uh, might mention between the Iliad and the Odyssey and the present. Now, an alternative thesis has been proposed by Colin Smith, who is the professor of Spanish in Cambridge University in England. He says this, the poet was a literate, well-informed, and cultured man who composed in writing with a full awareness of the basis of his craft as it had been devised and developed in French. For Smith, moreover, that man was the lawyer Parabat. Well, here we have, again, a very good example, a very classic kind of statement of the individualist school. We imagine a work of art consciously shaped by one person. That is not particularly controversial as one pole in this old debate. A bit more controversial in Colin Smith's interpretation is that Parabat was actually the author of El Cid. He may have been. El Cid is the oldest epic in Spanish, and it's the only reasonably complete one. This is interesting. The epic tradition seems not to have seated itself so firmly in Iberia as it did elsewhere in Europe. The poem did not, for example, exert much literary influence. One can't find allusions to it, references to it, copies of it. But it did, at several moments in Spanish history, have crucial cultural resonance. Just as, in some ways, the Song of Roland was seen to be a, a, a perfect reflection of the French national character, so also the great poem El Cid was seen to be somehow a reflection of the Spanish national character. We can characterize the basic structure of the poem uh, uh, briefly as a prelude to, to summarizing it, actually to telling the tale. The poem runs to 3,730 lines, plus five more in the signature, that little bit about Parabat. And it's organized, like Roland, into 152 less that are of unequal length. So we have a poem here that is longer than Beowulf, shorter than Roland. The lines in El Cid are divided by a caesura, but the half lines show a great deal more variability than do those of Beowulf or Roland. One may encounter half lines of as few as four syllables or as many as 14. Six to eight syllables per line, half line, I'm sorry, is the commonest pattern. Like Roland, the half lines depend on assonance, with the assonating vowels running through a less but not carrying on to the next one. The narrative of the poem runs right straight through, with very little in the way of asides or flashbacks, though it's true that the poet will sometimes pause and say, now I have to tell you about this. And what he really does there is he just sets the stage. 
he isn't really flashing back as, for example, the Beowulf poet did. He really just sets the stage. Basically, one can say that he drives forward with his narrative. The action, again like Roland, slows down and speeds up. And clearly this is a poetic device designed to focus our attention on certain events, certain people, certain developments, certain moments in the poem, and then to kind of skip quickly through other parts of the poem to get us to the next thing that the poet really wants us to think about. The poet uh, who created El Cid, Parabat or whomever, rarely uses the parallel or similar less that the Roland poet used. So he doesn't create the effect of multiple points of view the way the Roland poet did. Now, the story in El Cid revolves around two overlapping plots. The first of these concerns the Cid's exile and rehabilitation. The second concerns the marriages of the Cid's daughters. Now, as we have it, and there's no reason to suppose that, that, that there's been any changes introduced, the poema is divided into three cantares, three songs. The cantar of exile, the cantar of marriage, and the cantar of the outrage of Corpes. It's interesting to note that the cantares and the basic plot structure don't jibe. It's been suggested that the cantares may be how much of the poem was sung at a given time. Now we don't know that for sure, okay? Again, as with Roland, the poem was meant for oral presentation, indeed it was meant to be sung. But we have no idea what it sounded like, and we never will. We can read it on the page, but we must remember we were meant to hear it, and we were meant to hear it sung. Now, let's tell the story of the poets, perhaps Parabat's story, of Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, El Cid. As the poem opens, Rodrigo is departing Castile for his exile. Now, it's, it's a quite remarkable progress that he makes out of the kingdom of Castile and into the east of Spain. He accepts his unjust fate, and we're under no uh, illusions here. His fate was unjust. He was done in by factions at court. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. But he accepts this fate with dignity and resignation. He accepts it almost as a gift God has given him to prove himself. Now everywhere he goes, people profess their love and admiration for him, but they tell him that because of a powerful edict by the king, they simply cannot help him. That anyone who helps him is uh, leaving himself open to arrest and perhaps indeed to execution. Well, the Cid crosses over into Muslim territory. He takes a few frontier cities right on the boundary of Castile, and then he begins a series of brilliant campaigns against the Muslim princes in the east of Spain, the area called then, uh, and in the poem, the Levante. His initial band of, oh, 60 or so followers, something like this, swells to several thousand as he is going from one victorious battle to the next. Now, there may be reason for this. After every battle, the Cid generously shares the spoils. He makes his followers rich and famous. Their tales are told, their stories are sung. Here we have something again that reminds us of Beowulf and that reminds us a bit of Roland as well. You want glory and you want the cash. Several times in the poem, the Cid sends envoys to King Alfonso, bearing rich gifts, bearing shares of his, uh, of his spoils and treasures gained in his battles, and always giving assurances that he is a loyal vassal of his king. Now, after the fall of Valencia, Alfonso agreed to send the Cid's wife and daughters to him. They had been kept back in Castile all the time that the Cid was in exile. And he promises pardons to all of those who had gone off to join the Cid and he indicates that it's his intention to pardon the Cid himself. Meanwhile at the court, the Infantes, that is to say the heirs of Carrion, Diego and Fernando, begin to scheme to win the Cid's daughters as their wives. They're, they're saying, you know, this Cid guy is getting pretty famous and he's a pretty important guy and it would be a good marriage for our daughters, or for, for our sons to marry the Cid's daughters. 
Well, the king accepts the plan, as does the Cid, but the Cid has some real misgivings here. In fact, it seems pretty clear that had not the king accepted the plan, the Cid would not have done so. The point being, of course, that the poet is showing the Cid as the loyal vassal, as the good, faithful servant of his king. Well, the Infantes travel to Valencia, and the marriage is celebrated amidst joy and celebration. Quite a, quite a lovely scene of the uh, uh, entire wedding celebration. Now, the Infantes stay there with uh, the Cid and his family, and one night, a little later, in the Cid's palace, a pet lion escapes. He'd been kept in a kind of a netted cage, and he, he escaped. And, and in, a, in a scene that is actually humorous, uh, but that we are also meant to take very, very seriously, the Infantes are utterly terrified by this, by this pet lion, and they hide, and they hide under the furniture, and, and, and they're really made to look buffoonish. But more than that, they are made to look like cowards. Now, this is not something that a warrior aristocrat wants to do, is to appear to look, uh, as a coward. Now, a little bit later, in the face of battle, in the face of the enemy, the Infantes again proved to be cowards. Well, at this point, the Infantes go to uh, El Cid, and they ask permission to return home to Carrion with their wives. Actually, they plan to humiliate and repudiate them because of the affronts to their honor. Now, this is rather interesting here because what we know, as it were, as the observers of the poem, is that their honor was affronted by self-inflicted flaws and faults. No one did it to them, they did it to themselves. But of course, they're portraying themselves as having been dishonored. They thought that releasing the lion was a cruel trick, for example, designed to catch them out. Well, that doesn't answer the question, does it, why they should have been so cowardly in the face of this lion, whether his release was a trick or not. Apparently, it was not a trick, but this is the kind of thinking that was motivating the Infantes. Well, in the forest of Corpes, as the Infantes are traveling back to Carrion, the Infantes send everyone on ahead. And then they strip their wives, beat them brutally, and left them for dead. A relative just happened to uh, just hap- a relative of the of of the of El Cid's daughters happened upon the scene, revived uh, the, the the two young women, and brought them back to Rodrigo. Now, what would we expect to happen at this point in epic? Well, what we would expect is Rodrigo would get on his horse and go after these guys and and, and mutilate them. Oh no! Instead of seeking a blood revenge, the Cid appeals to the king. He argues that the Infantes have proved to be traitorous. Interesting move, because it had been the king, after all, who actually gave Doña Elvira and Doña Sol in marriage to the Infantes of Carrión. Now, at court, abetted by the duplicitous Count Garcia, the Carrión faction argued that they had made an unequal marriage, that the Cid's daughters were not of their social class, and that they had a perfect right to repudiate their wives, and argued that doing so, and indeed even the way they did so, treating them like mongrel dogs, brought them honor. Now, this is the sort of thing that is horrifying to us as we read the poem. But we have to realize that in the context of the poem, this argument was not absurd. So it tells us something about the kind of aristocratic values that motivated people in the Middle Ages. Though it seems pretty clear that the poet is not here inviting us to accept the argument of Garcia Ordóñez and the Infantes of Carrión, but he does represent their argument as a reasonable sort of position. Well, Alfonso was deeply aggrieved by all of this. Uh, Again, I mean, he has not been particularly keen on the Cid uh, all all the way through, but he he really does feel that something has gone terribly awry here, and he had, after all, given away uh, the two girls in marriage to the Infantes. So he summons a great court to meet in Toledo to adjudicate the matter. Now, we have... A, a wonderful and richly detailed description of the legal proceedings, of the judges, of all of the pleadings in the case, of the kinds of documents presented in the case. And, and, and the Cid comes forward uh, one after another with, with basic proposals, insisting on really guarding his own 
safety. After all, he had been in exile for a long time. And you'll remember that the king had said he intended to pardon the Cid. He had sent him his daughters and wife. He had sent, uh, he had pardoned a number of those who had gone off to fight with the Cid. But the Cid is still not quite sure of his position, and he knows there are people at court who hate his guts. So he, he goes through a whole series of legal maneuvers to, to satisfy his, his own position, to, to guarantee his own safety. Finally, of course, he insists that there will be a trial by battle. Now, we have a scene that, in other words, like not uh, at all unlike the one in Roland. Now, let me just pause here and say this, is, this, this remarkable account of this trial is part of what has led scholars like Colin Smith to see that a layman who was a lawyer may very well be the kind of author who is behind this poem. They, they, they suppose, for example, that, that a cleric, an ecclesiastic, might very well have given us all sorts of detailed pictures of ecclesiastical ceremonies, which we mostly do not find in El Cid, but would never have given us such detailed accounts of legal pleadings, such as in the case of the trial of the Infantes of Carrion. Now, that's a circumstantial argument. It's an interesting one. It seems to me to have great plausibility. You can't put it down as a fact. All right. The king guaranteed everyone's security. The battle was joined, and the Infantes were dealt a humiliating defeat. Well, we, we, we have a city. We, we want to come right up out of our chairs and cheer, sort of, at that point. Um, but uh, uh, So there is a sense that the justice is served, that the right thing sort of happens. The Cid then returns to Valencia, and his daughters married the sons of the kings of Navarre and Aragon. Well, that's all really quite, uh, uh, quite remarkable, and there are grains of historical truth behind uh, most of the events in the poem. Most. To build up his story, the poet used several key themes, several key issues. But in order to do so, he took license with historical reality. He took great license with historical reality. Many key characters, for example, are invented. Sid's friend Martin Antolines, for example, is almost surely an invention. So too, quite probably, is his faithful sidekick Alvar Fañez. Count Garcia is a ver perfectly real character, no question about that, but he was less a sneaky plotter than a man who, some years before, had been humiliated by Rodrigo uh, uh, before a battle, or after a battle, I'm sorry, and who therefore did have a grudge, but uh, one, one would say on historical grounds one could understand why he had a grudge. In any event, a lot of the history of, of, of the Cid's campaigns and this sort of thing is more or less accurate. The whole marriage plot in the poem is sheer fiction. The whole marriage story, one of the great themes of the poem, is, is sheer invention. Moreover, there was never the great reconciliation between the Cid and Alfonso. Certain basic kind of epic themes, some of the things that are always in the epic kit, if you like, are present here. Courage, prowess, a willingness to overcome huge odds on the battlefield. These are marks of the Cid and his men. Now, it's important to say that El Cid is, is a fully historical character, and he apparently was an enormously capable military leader. But we also have a sense in the poem that the truth is just stretched a bit. Now, it's interesting to notice, too, however, that the poem has in it nothing of the miraculous and magical, except Perhaps there's one scene when the angel Gabriel appears to the Cid in a dream. Now what's interesting is, of course, you're never responsible for things that happen to you in dreams. So Gabriel appears to Cid in a dream and assures him that in this life he will always be successful. Now the Cid is depicted as a very uh, uh, holy, a very but no, no, not holy for heaven's sake, a very pious, you see, a very conventionally pious man. But whereas the whole tone and tenor and aura of the Song of Roland is God's forces fighting against the, 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 the alien enemy forces of the Muslims, one doesn't see that sort of thing at all in the Cid. Now there are some scenes and some characters that are clearly patterned on Roland in whatever form the poet knew it. I mean, it's perfectly clear that the poet, the, the Cid poet, knew the Song of Roland. We might say, for example, that the aristocratic tone of Roland, and even to a degree of Beowulf, however, is absent. Aristocratic punctilio is always observed. Nobles always do exactly what they're supposed to and say what they're supposed to and behave in the ways that we would expect them to do. The courtly aspects of nobility are there. But in the poema, 
almost without exception, nobles are selfish, greedy, duplicitous, dishonorable. The poet appears to be making the point that nobility is a matter of character and not of birth. Now, as in all epics, honor is a central concern. The Cid is concerned about his honor. The Cid is very concerned about his honor. The Infantes of Carrion, in their bizarre fashion, are concerned about their honor. Garcia Ardoñez is concerned about his honor. King Alfonso is concerned about his honor. And yet, all of these different honors, if you will, come into conflict with one another. They bump up against each other. They are not uh, uh, comfortably seated next to one another in this poem. We saw that Beowulf was lofjornost, that is a most eager for praise, and that Roland at first refused to blow his horn. So there, there's nothing surprising here. It's interesting that the Cid wins honor and fame by his own actions. We don't have a sense of the remote past where these things have then lived on in popular memory, and certainly nothing is to be attributed to help, to birth, to station, to rank. This, this guy goes out, in a sense, makes his own career. In the end, what I think we can say is that the poet has here brilliantly created a new kind of epic hero. The Cid is far more than the great battler who always wins. All right? He is that. There's no question about that. But he is much more than that. If we ask ourselves really about Roland, or we ask ourselves about Beowulf, one of the things we would have to say is we don't get to know them. We don't really get to know them. What were they like? We don't really know that. With the Cid, we certainly know at least what the poema presents us with. We come to feel we know him very well. Now, we see him through the eyes of the poet. But at least we see him clearly. Now, context may very well be important here. In the 12th century, the Reconquista had not gone well. In 1195, for example, the Christian forces suffered a devastating defeat. The poet, it appears, wanted to encourage honorable Christian soldiers to enlist in the war against Muslims instead of indulging their taste for court politics and for a life of leisure. He certainly emphasizes, too, that one could win fame and fortune fighting on the frontier. Now, what the poet does, then, is create a new kind of civic ideal. All right, the Cid is a great warrior. There's no question about that. But he's a number of other things that we wouldn't necessarily expect an epic hero to be. He's an exemplary husband and father. He is a true friend. He's a generous sharer of spoils. He is always, always loyal to his totally undeserving king. He's cheerful and even uh, 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 philosophical in the face of exile. As I said, he, he views this in some ways as a gift God has given him to test him, to let him prove what kind of a man he is. He is always reflective. He is always prudent. He's always marked by precisely the mesure that Roland so conspicuously lacked. If you take just one wonderful example of this, when, when, when his poor daughters are brought back to him after, the, after they've been outraged, he doesn't go after the guys. He files a lawsuit. Maybe in that way he's very much a 21st century kind of guy. But that would be a story for a different day. It's fascinating to compare the trial of the Infantes with that of Ganelon. In Ganelon we have, in, in Roland, I'm sorry, we have an aristocratic world, a world of men, a world of knights, a world of royal values. The trial scene in Roland runs about a hundred lines. In the Cid, the trial scene runs about 450 lines and is very richly textured. This, again, I want to emphasize, is this sense of a civic hero. This is the way the world ought to be. You ought to play by rules, but not the rules of these sort of despicable aristocratic bad guys, but rather the kind of rules that, that govern, that operate, that make a successful society function. The poet throughout has a very powerful sense of a very great claim to verismo, truth. But for him, truth is wrapped up in character, not in the details of history. Or history can be retold in certain ways to tell truths greater than the mere facts 
the ordinary facts, the day-to-day -day events. So he could invent whole stories, the whole story of the daughters uh, uh, of the Cid and their marriage to the Infantes of Carrion. He can invent whole stories because they tell truths even if they are not true. In taking our leave, then, of this remarkable and fascinating character El Cid, we just look forward to our next lecture where we will take up romance, where yet other kinds of truths are depicted.